Welcome back. So in the second half of this presentation, first of all, I want to let you know that the slides and the video and all that will obviously be on Parlays. So everyone that comes to the conference gets access to that. So you can see this as it happened here on there. I will also do my best to put it up online. It might take me a couple weeks because that video doesn't have my voice over to the narration. So I need to add that in. But I will do that once I get home. I also have a number of business cards up here if you want to contact me with questions after or hit me up on Twitter and I'll be happy to answer them there. So moving on from Angular, one of the things that I've noticed is that Angular very much resembles what Google is calling the next generation of web development and that is web components, which is actually a spec from the W3C. So there's templates which define chunks of markup that can be activated for later use. And people do this right now with script tags and different content types or you know, hiding things in the page. And the difference is with templates, it's actually not processed. So right now, if you have an image tag and you have a source on it, um, that will actually get processed with the page load. And with templates, they're actually processed when the JavaScript processes them. Um, decorators, which apply templates based on CSS selectors, um, custom elements like you've seen with, uh, with what we're doing with Angular with our field tag, for instance. Um, it will allow you to define your own as well as there's components that are coming out like the calendar component and, uh, and things that browsers will actually execute and do all the rendering there so you don't have to do it in your HTML. Shadow DOM, which encapsulates a DOM subtree for more reliable composition. And uh, imports, which defines how templates, decorators, and everything is packaged and, and loaded as a resource. So obviously, these kind of things will only be in the latest and greatest browsers. But it's more motivation to you know, get your companies or get your managers to allow you to, to use the latest technologies to build better apps. Um, in the meantime, if you want to kind of use a hybrid of you know, what Web Components offers and, and what you can do with something like Angular, um, Google has announced the Polymer project, which has polyfills in it, has a MVC framework as well, and basically it's designed to leverage the evolving web on modern browsers. So it only supports evergreen browsers, which I think is a great concept. If you can take this home and convince your company to actually use it, um, an evergreen web browser is a browser that automatically ups it, updates itself. So phones have evergreen browsers, Chrome, Firefox, even IE now, the latest version is evergreen browser. So you know, that's kind of where we're going is, is hopefully we'll get to a time where people aren't stuck on an old browser. As long as they're connected to the internet, they're getting updates all the time. And Polymer has a bunch of UI components in there. It's a pretty new project, though, only a few months old. But um, if you go and, and search on Google or take a look at their home page for it. It's, uh, it's certainly up and coming. So um, they're really driving a lot of you know, what happens with Java developers and what we're learning about UI. There's GWT or GWT, um, AngularJS, and, and now Polymer. So some really great frameworks coming out of Google. Um, to look you know, at a bare bones Polymer example, um, you'll load the JS file before it touches the DOM. And then you'll load components using a link tag. And you'll say rel equals import. And then you'll point to the, to the various components you want to use. And then you'll declare that component by its tag. So it's, it's similar to how we're doing directives. It's just doing it with HTML. Bootstrap is a CSS framework that has really helped Java developers a fair amount. One of the differences, the main differences that I've seen between Ruby on Rails and why it became so popular so fast was because a lot of designers were able to pick it up and use it and figure it out. And so a lot of Ruby on Rails applications that came out initially looked good by default. Versus Java, we had a bunch of guys using Struts1, JSPs, JSF, that never had any CSS component or anything built in, or did we have any sense of what might look good. So a lot of Java applications were business applications and they never really look good versus like Rails and PHP. Those guys kind of had a more of a designer background and were able to create good looking stuff by default. And so Bootstrap comes out a couple years ago, the most popular project on GitHub. And now, first of all, it's great because you can make your websites look good. But second of all, now everyone's using it. 
So there's a ton of bootstrap sites out there or the default look and feel that, you know, now it kind of looks the same, but it, it looks a lot better than, uh, than no CSS. So bootstrap defines um, layouts, navigation, pagination, buttons. And I like to think that if we had this back in like 2004, the component web frameworks in the Java space might have never happened because it has a lot of the components that those frameworks had in there. And, uh, and it does mobile first, also called responsive design, um, awesome jQuery plugins, and components that allow you to basically develop the kind of web application you want to develop. So I'm going to do a Bootstrap 3 deep dive. There won't be any coding in this. Decided to give you a break from that. See if this one works in present mode. Much better. It is a Google spread or a slideshow, so it should work. So Bootstrap 3, like I said, is mobile first. Um, they overhauled all their transitions to be CSS based. Um, and then they reinforce the JavaScript for older browsers or as necessary. Um, they also dropped IE7 and Firefox 3.6 support. So if you need to support these, you can still use them with Bootstrap 2, um, but Bootstrap 3 does not have them. Um, and they combine the standard and responsive CSS into a single file. So before, it just had Bootstrap CSS. If you wanted to have a responsive website, then you added you know, a second CSS file to your site. Um, it's 100% faster than the previous version. And this is because of how browsers, you know, take the CSS, apply it to DOM objects, and render the page. And so there's been a couple different tests done. A lot of it's because it now has a flat design. And so it's not worried about rounding corners or, you know, making gradients or anything like that. And uh, that might have been why people liked it, but, you know, since Windows 8 and iOS 7 come out, people are liking the flat design as well. So in web development, we face a lot of challenges. Um, the web browsers, the good thing is that IE is dying. Um, this is the top five browsers from 2008 to just you know yesterday. And you can see that uh, IE is, is gone on the wayside, and Chrome's doing very well, um, largely because of Windows users. With IE 6, we're, uh, we're down to 5%. So good for that. The crazy thing is IE7 is less than 1%. Um, IE6 is still at 5, so that baffles me. Um, and, uh, and IE8 is 10% worldwide. Um, so it is getting better. Um, you guys in Europe are at 8%. We in North America are at 11. And uh, we're both under 1 on IE7. So um, you can show your managers that, and hopefully that will help them not support IE7. Um, today's web developer, you know, with all the HTML5 stuff, um, CSS3, JavaScript, server-side languages, and, you know, the back-end stuff, there's just a ton of stuff that you have to know. But if you know it all, you're valuable, you'll get good rates, you'll get good jobs. So um, it, it can be worth learning. You do have to put a lot of time in. Um, but, you know, and then you got mobile devices. So, <laughs> so how do you cope with it all? Um, the mobile traffic is going to outnumber desktop traffic by next year. And so that's why, you know, mobile first is important. Um, the mobile OS is Android's taken off. So as a Java developer, that helps um, that, you know, you're learning Java and you could program an Android device. The screen resolutions, 320 by 480, still the most popular, but they are getting bigger. And designing a different interface for all these different phones and desktops and everything is, is impossible. Right? It's just too much work. Um, but luckily, Bootstrap is the answer to all our problems. <laughs> so what is Bootstrap? It's a CSS framework, and there's a JavaScript file, too, that allows you to build the kind of things that you might do in a Swing app or you might do in a traditional you know, application um, using HTML and CSS classes. So it has a grid system, it has a responsive design, it has the ability to show and hide things based on what 
type of device it is. If it's a tablet or if it's a phone, then you know, don't show this information. It's got typography, which just means it resets the font sizes that, so they're the same in all browsers. Um, it styles tables so they look good, forms, buttons, and icons, and drop downs, and breadcrumbs, and um, basically a lot of the things you need in a web application. The reasons to love Bootstrap is almost anyone can learn it. If you know HTML and CSS, it's just popping in CSS classes. Um, it's got excellent documentation. They actually use their documentation as a reference of how everything works. Um, works across all browsers, all mobile devices. It's pretty lightweight. Um, it's open source and it's built on less. And less is, uh, is basically a way of writing style sheets with a programming language. So it was started in the early days of Twitter by Mark Otto and Jacob Thornton. Um, its first release was August two years ago. And uh, they just had their 3.0 release in August of this year on the same day. So that's pretty good by nailing it. Um, 102,000 Twitter followers, um, the most watches on GitHub, and 21,000 forks. So it's a very popular project. And what I'd like to do is, is basically show you how you can use it to style the various elements in your projects. So the first thing you do is you just go to the site and you download it. It's ready to go. But they also have the ability online for you to go and customize everything. So by default, they have certain colors you know, for buttons, um, certain padding for forms, certain you know, styling for tables. And you can go in there and tweak all those variables on an HTML page and then spit out your own customized version. And that's, um, I think it's great. But in the real world, what a lot of people do is they download the raw version and then they override those styles with their own style sheet and say, hey, for IE7, do this, or you know, for this other project, do that. And so I haven't run across a lot of people that are customizing it, but I think they probably do exist. Um, you have to have an HTML5 doc type, and you just include Bootstrap CSS. And then there's a number of starter templates that you can use to basically you know, have a certain marketing site, or a documentation site, or an admin console um, that they provide by default. So the scaffolding consists of a 12-column grid. Uh, I'm not going to go into that too much, just because it's, uh, it's pretty easy. There's a, with, with Bootstrap 2, what they had was this span right here. And they would do span 1, span 2, span 3, span 4, all the way up to 12. And so as long as you had a row that was in, you know, or spans within a row, then it would, it would do it accordingly. With Bootstrap 3, they have call-md. And md is for medium-sized desktop. Um, there's also XL, XS for phones and, uh, and LG for um, TVs. And so these are all the new things. Used to be they had fluids, fluid layouts, so it would stretch the size of a screen. And, and now they just do a container. If you want to make it fluid, you can. They show you how in the documentation. So. If you're upgrading from 2 to 3, here's a bunch of classes that have changed. And removed in 3, there's a number of things that are gone. So I just wanted to throw those in there in case you were familiar with Bootstrap and you're thinking about upgrading. Um, I actually advise that no one ever upgrades their CSS framework. It's a terrible idea. I mean, when you have CSS, you never like migrate it to the next version. Usually, you get it all right. It works in IE7. It works in IE8. Why would you go and change all your classes or remove a whole bunch of classes? It just doesn't make sense. So if you start with Bootstrap on one version, unless there's a major bug that they fixed, I wouldn't bother upgrading ever, unless you're creating a new project. It just it isn't something we ever did before. We never went and changed all our CSS before. Once you have your design locked down, that's pretty much it forever. So. Um, if you're upgrading from two to three, chances are maybe you developed an open source project, maybe you're doing something for a conference, but in the real world, in your companies, I don't recommend it. So with the grid system, it starts out with a container. You just put a class on a div, and then that gives you the ability to put stuff inside it. Like I said, there's 12 columns, um, 940 picks. Um, the grid adapts to be 724 or 1170 based on the viewport, which is you know, what you're viewable in your screen. And so they will stack vertically on a mobile device, or they will stretch out on a desktop. Um, they use media queries, CSS3 media queries, to do the 
responsive de design, modifies the width of the column, stacks it appropriately, and uh, all you need is a viewport in there. So the viewport tag, if you haven't known about it, um, this could be enough to pay for your cost of the conference. Um, it works very well. Introduced by Apple, everyone supports it. Basically scrunches your site so it looks good on a mobile device. And once you have that in there, you can also set maximum scale equals 1.0 or user scalable equals no. Both of those elements will make your website look like an app where you can't like zoom in or zoom out. It's you know, similar to an app where you can't zoom in and zoom out on apps. Makes your web page like that. Oh, I also wanted to show you at the bottom here with uh, 3.0, um, they added a new class for image responsive. So if you want to make your images so they stretch out, or actually, it's, it's a great tip. If you want to make your images look good on a mobile device, stop adding width or stop adding height to them and use you know, something like this where it says the max width is 100%. Because what that does is the browser is smart enough that if you give it a width, it'll figure out the height, maybe not on initial load, but then by having that class as max width equals 100, we'll make it so it, it stretches to fill you know, the space on a, on a mobile device. And that's what I do with most of my applications now. So to give you an, ex so to give you an example of these responsiveness, you can see here, I have to get out of full screen now. like double full screen. Let me out. You can see here, it you know, visible is on. Green checks indicate the class is visible in the current viewport. All right, and we squish it down. And then it's, we'll work on phone and tablets. We take it up, and it hides things. So those are just based on CSS classes that they have in there. and allows you to, you know, very easily kind of target those mobile devices. Devices. So the base CSS, um, typography, H1, H2, H3, those are uh, semi-bold, 36 PX for the H1s. Um, and the, the whole point in this is making it consistent across your browsers. If you don't have a reset framework or something like that in there to make it consistent across browsers, you'll get different sizes in IE versus Firefox and IE on Mac versus you know IE on Windows. Um, I don't think they make IE on Mac anymore, but it used to be really um, different. Um, body copy, you know, puts the appropriate padding above and below paragraphs, so it looks good by default. Um, block quotes um, look good with a nice line on the left. Also, the site, um, if you use that tag in there, it'll kind of, you know, make it look like you might want it to look. Um, emphasis classes, you can do text muted, um, so it kind of grays it out. Success, info, warning, and danger, kind of colors them accordingly. Alignment, if you want to worry about aligning things right, left, or center. You can just add text left, text center, text right. Default styles for tables. Kind of gives them a nice look without a border, but just a line on the rows. If you want them to be striped, you can by adding table-striped. Table bordered if you want the borders. Or if you want hoverability, where you hover over a row and it you know, colors it, you can just add a class. Condensed, kind of squishes the padding down a bit. Um, there's also row classes you can add if you want to highlight a certain row. Um, active success, warning, and danger. You put those on the TR and it'll color the row accordingly. There's also a number of different forms. For forms, you have vertical, inline, and horizontal. So if you want to put your labels to the left or to the top, um, it's also got the ability to style your, your controls and uh, relative sizing for the different form elements. So by default, here's how a form might look. It's got a legend you know, the paints on the top and then a label and an input and a, and a help block there that you might put under a field and, uh, and a button. So this is the Bootstrap 3 look where it doesn't have the gradients. Um, still got, you know, a little bit around quarters there, but no gradients on the buttons. Um, the horizontal version puts the labels to the left side. The inline version, if you want to do it up in the header, you just use form-inline. And then you can use sizing on your various elements. So input LG, input SM, 
and large basically adjust the text size. So one of the things they had in, in Bootstrap 2 was you could adjust the width. And they no longer advocate doing that on the, the actual element itself. They want you to do it on the divs around the element. And this is what that looks like. So call dash XS two, three, four, um, stretches them accordingly, and you just put wrappers around it. And then for buttons, um, they used to have, if you just added a button class, it would give the default behavior. But now they've namespaced it, so you have to add button default as well. Um, button primary gives it the blue, info, success, warning, danger, and link. And one of the things that they did do to make it backwards compatible with 2.0 that people could grab was they now have theming support. So if you grab the default theme, then it gives you the puffy buttons like came with Bootstrap 2. Um, images, you can add circles or thumbnails and, uh, and have those you know, look good. Um, you can also have glyph icons. So glyph icons is a bunch of fonts that, um, that they use to create icons. So you can easily add like an I class um, glyph icon and then a specific icon to your code and it'll show up like as a you know, person on a button or as a star or something like that. There's dozens of reusable components for navigation, alerts, popovers, um, breadcrumbs, labels and badges, um, progress bars. And so for buttons, you can group them together with a button group. So btn-group as a div will uh, group those together so they're all you know, squished like that. Um, you can also add drop downs on buttons. And, uh, and using their CSS, you can actually have links that look like buttons. Or you can have actual buttons. Input type equals button. Input type equals submit. Or just the button element itself. For the nav bar, if you want to you know, have the nav bar at the top, um, use a, a nav bar class and a nav bar default. And then you have a header. And then you have a collapsible section. And the beauty of this is if you use their nav bar and you use their HTML in this way, when you squish your browser, it becomes a little icon in the corner that on a mobile device you can just click on and then you know navigate that way so it doesn't you know clutter up the top of the screen tabs if you want tabs breadcrumbs pagination and you'll see a lot of this is just adding css classes onto certain elements alerts if you want good looking alerts with a close button in the top corner that's how you do it so there's that first one is a warning second one's success third one's danger fourth one's info those are just alert dash, whatever it is. And the JavaScript for Bootstrap basically gives them life and allows them to interact with different things. Um, all the plugins require the latest version of jQuery. And that's like 1.9 at the time. Um, 1. or 2.0 doesn't support IE8, I don't think. So I don't know how that's going, but it's preventing a lot of people from upgrading to jQuery 2.0. Um, you can you know, use all the plugins, or you can download them individually. I generally grab them all. And then uh, you can do transitions, modals, drop downs, tabs, and basically allows you when you click on those to you know do the certain behavior. And you can also use it purely without writing any JavaScript. So I think this appeals to a lot of designers because they can just add the classes or the data dash elements to their pages, and boom, it works. So for a modal, this is what it might look like, um, and you can see here the div class is modal. And then it has a class of fade. And that fade will actually make the modal fade in and out. There's no JavaScript necessary. You do have to include like, you know, the JavaScript file on your page, but you don't have to write any. And then similarly with this button up here, you know, it has the ability to close it. And you don't have to do anything to, to close it with JavaScript. It does it by default. There's a carousel if you want to slide different pieces of content in your page or you know, have different images for a slideshow, um, a carousel component to do that. The most important thing is the class carousel up here. And if you want those indicators like Apple does, you can do them right here. Here's where you show the content. And then those left and right controls at the bottom. Popovers, if you want to click on a link or show some information, you can do them on the top, on the right, on the bottom, on the left. 
You can also click on a button and have it show up. Again, no JavaScript required except for the reference to the JavaScript file. And then it's all built with less. So since there is a tremendous amount of JavaScript in there, um, less is used to basically have dynamic behavior to CSS. Um, makes it a little more maintainable. It's got variables and mix-ins. And by mix-ins, I mean you can reference you know, one line of code and it pulls in five lines of code from somewhere else in the, that you define. Um, you can have nested elements, which would be great if they had that in CSS, but they don't. Um, you can do operations. You can define functions. Um, you can do it on the client and the server, um, but generally people you know, use it on the client and then compile it to CSS and then send it to their browsers. So someone asked me during the break, about all these technologies and CoffeeScript versus less and you know should you be using those in your projects and uh, and a lot of times it comes down to your team and your company and your project um, for me as a consultant I go around to a lot of different companies and generally what I do is I take a full-time client for three to six months at a time and um, I like good rates so typically when I go to a client um, they pay good rates and the reason they pay good rates is they're in trouble so a lot of these latest and greatest technologies I don't get to work with because they're just trying to get the thing out the door, the project, and they're not trying to actually use the latest and greatest technology. So if you're fortunate enough to work in a company that will allow you to use less or use CoffeeScript, I encourage you to try it. Um, but if you have developers that you work with that are resistant to learning new technologies, it might be tough. And so you know, I typically do CSS and JavaScript most of my days. And uh, I don't really have a problem with it. I never you know, saw a huge need for something like less or for CoffeeScript, but I'm not writing 20,000 lines of code either. I'm just you know, fixing stuff or developing a feature or something like that. So with less, you can have variables that you define. So you could have a color that's defined once in your whole file, and then it's referenced in other parts of your class. This is what mix-ins look like. You can have uh, rounded corners and then pull those in to different parts of your page. You only have to define it once. So it's just, it's dry, right? Don't repeat yourself. It's eliminating a lot of the redundancy that we have in CSS. And there's also a number of themes. So this is one of the things that I think people have kind of overlooked is there's the ability with Bootswatch to go in and download a new theme that looks really good. Um, even Start Bootstrap has a great admin theme that you can download. All are free, all are open source. Um, wrap bootstrap costs money so they have themes that you can buy so chances are if you're doing you know a launch for a company then you might want to actually buy one because it's less likely that other people have it still they're cheap they're only you know 20 30 bucks something like that um, if you want to use jQuery UI but have it look like bootstrap you can do that too you can download the jQuery UI bootstrap theme and then all your jQuery UI components look like bootstrap and there's also um, font awesome I see a typo there it's not Ford awesome it's font awesome um, that actually shows, um, replaces those glyph icons with font awesome icons. So it's still a font based technique to rendering icons, um, but it just has their own, and those are all free and open source. And the one thing I really like about Bootstrap is it emphasizes a lot of the things that I've learned about categorizing CSS and writing CSS, and I learned most of that from the SMACS book, Scalable and Modular Architecture for CSS. And they basically have patterns that they define on how to write your CSS and how you namespace it accordingly because a lot of times you know we're just naming things with a certain class and defining our CSS somewhere else and boom you know go with that and you know they emphasize you know setting some baseline styles um, for your body your forms your inputs your links and then moving on from there for your layouts and uh, and naming things you know accordingly um, with state um, with fields um, how to do inline styles, and it's really a great book that I highly recommend. So we'll come out of that, move on to the next section. Let me out. Okay. The next section is high performance websites. And you wouldn't believe how many times that I've gone into organizations and sped up their application by 100% in my first two weeks. And so my last project I started in September, and the VP of engineering was convinced 
that their slowness was on the back end. And it turns out that he was partially right, but what I was able to discover, and this is the second time I've done this in two years, is that we were able to increase the performance of the web app, and by performance I mean the time it takes for the pages to load by, you know, 100% within, you know, a few days by just performing some basic page performance techniques. Um, making fewer HTTP requests, um, not so many DNS look lookups, minifying the JavaScript, avoiding redirects, um, removing duplicate scripts, and uh, this was all, you know, pioneered by Steve Souders back in 2008 um, in a book he wrote called High Performance Websites, and people have kind of, you know, got into it, and, uh, and still it doesn't seem like a lot of people are doing it. Um, G-zipping, um, scripts at the bottom, avoiding CSS expressions, they're all pretty simple to do, and if you do them in the beginning, then chances are you'll, you'll keep doing them and your application will continue to perform. E-tags, make Ajax cacheable. There's, there's 14 different rules, and I think it's up to 20 now in the latest edition um, that you can do to make things faster. But I'm just going to give you a few. So first of all, even devox.be could use some uh, enhancement. Their score is a 76. And, uh, and I didn't see how long it takes for the page to load, but you can see there they have no expires headers. There's no CDN. They have 50 external background images. Way too many. So it loads kind of fast, but if you load it on your phone, it, it's not that fast. So, um, and there's no gzipping. Um, they could do better there. So these are, these are things that can improve almost any site. Um, with my experience at my last two clients, um, the biggest problem that I found is HTTP requests. So as soon as you do like the basic things with gzipping and expires headers, um, HTTP requests, a lot of people have, you know, five to 10 to maybe 20 JavaScript files. They have, you know, a few CSS files and they're all inlining them differently, just like I did my AngularJS example. And, uh, and it is easy to actually combine all those into one. And I'm going to show you how. Um, for gzipping and expires headers, um, those are things that you can do at your web server level. And gzipping has been supported in browsers since Netscape 4.0. So 15 years ago, or 10 years ago, or something like that, where it basically compresses it on the server and then the client's able to, you know, expand it and show it. Um, a lot of times it reduces the network load by 70%. So you'll actually save money if you pay for bandwidth. Um, the other thing that I've seen a big performance increase from is image sprites. So instead of having, you know, 20 different icons in your page, you have a sprite that then use CSS to point out that here's the icon that I want to load. And SpriteCow is an online tool that you can use to upload images and then, you know, figure out the CSS that you need to show just that part of the image. WR4J is a great project to implement the concatenation and minification of CSS in your Java projects. It's available basically as two different things. Um, you can have it as a build time tool. There's a Maven plugin, there's an Ant task, or you can have it as runtime, where at runtime it, it does it once and then it caches it for the duration of while your app is up. Um, it's also got support for doing the CoffeeScript or the less compilation or SAS compilation um, to do that as part of your process too. There's also another project I'd like to recommend if you're using Maven called WebJars. WebJars packages client-side web libraries into jars, so they can be referenced as dependencies in your project. So you can have jQuery, you can have Bootstrap, um, you can have all kinds of different ones. You can have Angular. Um, if you have Servlet 3, which I highly recommend you support, it's supported in the latest what, um, most application servers, um, it's just you drop the jar into your project and it's available at a WebJars path. Um, Drop Wizard, Grails, Spring MVC, they all support it. Um, the URL rewrite filter I use a lot too to have pretty URLs in my applications. And if you're using Spring MVC, the default servlet handler is your friend. You can add that one tag to your Spring context files and then map the servlet to the root path of your application. And so that gives you the ability to have pretty URLs basically. With the URL rewrite filter and with uh, WR4J, I've done uh, versioning static assets. So if you set expires headers on your CSS and your JavaScript, a lot of times what they recommend is you set them for like a year in advance. Well, the problem is if you have, you know, 
CSS slash bootstrap.css, no one's going to get a new version of it. And so you need to have the ability to change that path. So what I do is I put version numbers in the path, not as a query string, but in the path. Or you can do it at build time where it creates like an MD5 string of all you know, the components in there. Um, and that's that web resource fingerprinting that um, one of the AppFuse developers implemented. So both of those links, you can go there and, and figure out how to do that. Um, the first one, I'm going to show you a demo of. The second one, um, you'll have to go read. Um, and, the, and the second one worked OK. I did implement it on a project recently. But the problem was it was at build time, and it took probably like 15 to 20 seconds. And the last thing you want to do is increase the build time on a Maven build. Um, so I ended up taking it out, and it just does it at runtime now. Um, I also wanted to make you aware of Nginx, in case you're not aware, um, because it is you know, an up-and-coming web server. Um, a lot of people are using it, WordPress, GitHub, Heroku, and uh, it's just as good as Apache. And uh, a lot of times it's used as an IMAP or a POP3 server, so you should be aware of it. Um, you can set it up on Mountain Lion or, or Mavericks if you have it using that link. But to do this demo, I'm going to use um, Apache. And so Apache ships with mod, or it doesn't ship with mod PageSpeed, but mod PageSpeed is a plugin from Google that does a lot of the things we're talking about. And I haven't tried it in probably two years. Um, and I've had some clients try it, and it's never quite worked. But it is like the holy grail if it does work, because it takes your CSS, it takes your JavaScript, it combines them all, it moves your JavaScript to the bottom of the page, it gzips, it does everything for you. The problem is if you're you know, dependent on certain order of elements in your page, it might mess things up, or it might mess up your JavaScript if the files aren't meant to be combined. So I recommend you know, maybe trying that first. And if that works for you, then hey, your work's done. But otherwise, um, the mod deflate and mod expires are, are two of your best friends. Um, I did it on AppFuse, where we had all our demos hosted online. And I was able to take the page speed score from 24 to 96 and the YSLO score from 90 to 98. So YSLO is already pretty good. But generally, it means that you know, it goes from you know, loading in 10 seconds to loading in 4. And, uh, and that's you know, a pretty big improvement, especially because a lot of people, if you don't have your expires headers configured, even though you think the browser is caching it the first time, it might not be. It might not be caching your CSS and your JavaScript, which means every time your page loads, it's going and grabbing that code. And I, I, the reason um, I wasn't able to do page speed is because if you're using Red Hat Enterprise 4, um, it requires Apache HTTPD 2.2 and libstct++412. They're unsupported. So now you know that. So now we're going to jump into a page speed deep dive where I show you how I implemented them. And we learn that and we learn that that doesn't work, so we do MP4. So I'm going to create a new AppFuse application because I feel like if you're using, if you're a Java developer, you can relate. So AppFuse is just, you know, this is a Spring MVC application. We're going to go ahead and start it up. You've never seen Maven start that fast, have you? So there it is, simple application. If we look at the YSLO score, it's a 79. So similar to DevOx, right? We got some issues with expires headers, some gzipping, and it's missing a CDN. So the first thing we're doing is I'm going to configure mod proxy. Um, so I think that's important. I'm just going to go back there and show you that. Um, this is the reason you want to do page speed, is if you look at this, I'll go back and stop. One, two. So yeah, look at those. Look at those. The statistics is an important one. This is what I always show clients. So you can see here, HTTP request is 10. Usually with a lot of apps, that's like 60. And, uh, and the total weight is 264K. I've seen a lot these days that are 600 to a, a meg. And, uh, and if the, you've already seen the page and you request it again, it's the same. And what that should be on the second time around is just the HTML should be sucked down. Everything else should be cached the first time around. So the first thing I'm going to do is configure mod proxy, which I do with a lot of times just so I can request it without the port number in there. 
So you can configure that easy enough with Apache. You just turn it on and then you say, hey, for you know the root element, go to this URL. And so you can even do that where it goes to other servers, you know, from a particular URL. So now I can strip 8080 out of the URL and it still works. And that allows, you know, Apache to talk to Tomcat. And now I'm going to add in expires headers. So in Apache 2, you just create an expires.conf. And this requires, you know, that Apache already has it loaded, but it did on mine. And I say, hey, for all images, um, two weeks. And for all CSS and JavaScript, two weeks. And save it. Restart. Make sure I have the port out of there. And then take another reading with y slow. And the weird thing is, it doesn't show the expires headers. See, I still got an F there. And this is a good old shift reload thing. So shift reload to clear my cache. Take it again. This time it works. So now it's got the expires headers in there. There's no issues there. The next thing I want to do is uh, add gzip compression. I copied and pasted all this, right? So you don't you don't have to memorize it either. But once you you know get it once, then you can use it on all your projects, and uh, you get all this performance. So now we have expires headers. We're up to a 92. And the only thing that's really going to get better is fewer HTTP requests. You can see that we're not caching anything except the, we're caching everything but the HTML and, uh, and using a CDN. So I'm going to add in web jars because I think that's a good way to manage your CSS and your JavaScript. They're basically just client-side web libraries in jar files. So there's a bootstrap one. There's a date picker that I'm using. There's a jQuery. I'm downgrading jQuery because there's issues with HTML unit, which I use to test this app. And jQuery cookie plugin. And then I'm going to go ahead and delete the old files that I did have in the project so you can see that I'm not reusing anything or I'm not cheating. And go ahead and delete these. Actually, those stay. I just got to change the URLs. So web jars is where they're mounted to by servlet3. And so for those particular files, I just change the URLs. And then I restart. Luckily, I can speed things up in a screencast. Oh, didn't work. This is because there's something in this particular project where I'm having clean URLs, and uh, and I have to go into the URL rewrite class and say, hey, for web jars, you know, instead of processing it through Spring MVC, go ahead and process it as you normally would. So, um, with that default servlet URL with Spring MVC, I, I could solve this problem, but I haven't done it in this particular project yet. So now it works. And now I'm going to add in uh, WR4J because what I want to do is I want to basically combine all those CSS and JavaScript files. So I'm going to create a JSP tag file to do this. Does anyone use JSP tag files? So it's just a dot tag file that's kind of like a, uh, a JSP tag, but you don't write any Java code. So first of all, I add the dependency for WR4J. 
And then under the webinf directory, you create a tag directory, tags directory. I'm going to put asset.tag in there. And so this will be um, what I do for, for showing my CSS and the JS. And the reason I'm doing this is because with, uh, with WR4J, they allow you to pass in a minimize equals false to your URL for your assets, and then it'll, it won't combine them, and it won't minify them. But the problem is, is they're still combined in, it's still a single request, right? So it separates out the files, so you don't know where the line number is on the particular file that you want to debug or that's happening in JavaScript. So what I do is I create the ability for me to say, write out your files as you would normally, but also concatenate them in production. So I use a debug flag. If there's a debug flag on the URL that says debug equals true, then I write out the files like I would normally, and if not, then I, uh, then I concatenate them and use the WR4J stuff. So I pass in a group so I can define different groups if I want from WR4J. Here's how I set up the debugging. I say, hey, if the debug is set, then go ahead and uh, write the old way, talking to the web jars. If it's not set, then go ahead and use assets slash v, which is a version number, and then the assets version, which I set when the application starts up. So if it's a snapshot, I use a random number. If it's a version of the app that's been released, then I use that. And so I have some logic to do that on app startup. And that's what I do in the startup listener. So I have a war file that, that puts a manifest dot in there, and it has the application version. And then in here, I'm able to say, OK, look for that. Is it in there? If not, if it is, then use it. Otherwise, just create a random number. That's a cache buster. So the clients will you know, always fetch a new version. Then I add the filter to my web XML for WR4J, and I map it to assets. And then I have to create two files, the WRO.properties, where I put in uh, whether it gzips or if it wants to do CSS URL rewriting, um, the processes to use and a wr.xml that defines my JavaScript and my CSS files. So I have a group in here called main. And I say, hey, my CSS is located on the class path in this web jar, um, and my JavaScript is too. And then I remember from last time that I need to map it in my URL rewrite, so I go in there and do it for assets. And I start it up and go to look at it. And what did I forget? I forgot to change the references to the CSS and JS. All right, so it all works, but you'll see it's still got those individual links instead of you know, one for the assets. So that's because I didn't modify my decorator. So I go in here, delete it out, and I refer to that T assets, right? That's the tag I just created. And to define that, I have a tag libs file where I include and you just point to the tags directory. So you say, hey, the prefix is t, tags there is webinf tags. That's how you do JSP tags. Reload it. Doesn't work. What did I do wrong? Man, it should work. Because you're going to run into this when you try it. And then you look at you say, OK, open up. Oh, error. And good old Maven in class not found exception. And no class def found, old bomb input stream. So I don't know how I knew this, but I figured it might be Commons I.O. I looked. There's an old version. And then I remembered that there's a new version with the bomb input stream. I don't know how, but I actually did. And then uh, change the group ID since it warned me about that. Change that to uh, 2.4. And now it'll work. And then to make a long story short, since we're running out of time, um, you can kind of watch it in the background. The, the next thing that happens is I, I refresh it, and it's overriding the expires headers. And the reason for that is the expires headers um, are overridden by WR4J 
when it has debug equals true in that wro.properties. So by setting it to false, it allows you to do it on the server. If you set it to true, what it does is it sets its own expires headers, so it tries to you know, prevent you from caching them. So I show here how with debug false, um, you'll see the actual individual files. Um, here the expires headers aren't going to work. I actually recorded the video of me talking to the mailing list and, uh, and getting the solution for that. Luckily, I figured it out. Um, and then the next thing that I do towards the end of the video is I show on CloudFront how you can actually go and create a CDN resource. And on CloudFront, all you have to do is basically say where you're hosting your CSS and your JS, and then it'll point to that, and then you change your application to use that CloudFront URL. So you give it the full server name, slash project name, and then it pulls the CSS and it pulls the JavaScript from your project. So I was able to get this project up to, I think, a 97 or a 98. Locally, I got it to a 99, but when I got it uploaded to uh, my demo site, I realized that it didn't actually have um, the same Apache expires header setting. So um, I wasn't able quite to get 100%. But this is debugging and figuring out that that debug needs to be true or false. And I'll publish that whole thing with narration here after the narration here after the after the show. And then just to show you in the slide so you could use this yourself, um, these are the settings I use for gzipping. Um, this is the biggest important performance improvement you can do right away um, when you get home on your applications. Um, expires headers, um, that's how you do it for that. I wrote a blog post how we did it on AppFuse and uh, you know the issues we encountered there so you could read about that. Um, for load testing, I highly recommend Newstar, which used to be Browser Mob. And we used that on James Ward and I's uh, Play versus Grail Smackdown, where we basically hammered on our servers with, uh, you can hammer on it with 1,000 real users or 50,000 real users. Um, you can also do simulated users. So simulated users isn't quite as much, but real users, it actually fires up Amazon instances, use Selenium, and drives a browser to hit your application. And so you write the script in, uh, in an easy to use scripting language that says, you know, go here, do this, input this, and, uh, and make it happen. And I think it's a great way to do load testing because it's not, you know, internal, it's external. It's how your users actually perceive your application. Um, for performance monitoring, I, I recommend looking at New Relic, um, which you install an agent in your application. It talks to New Relic, and then they have dashboards and things that you can use to see um, how your UI is performing as well as how your backend and your um, load testing is performing or your memory. Um, Google Analytics has gotten better and better. Um, they also have real user monitoring now where you can see real time who's on your application, who's doing what, and uh, that's you know a really nice feature um, to know who's doing what. Um, if you want to do it yourself and monitor your backend performance, uh, metrics is a nice library, metrics.codahale.com. Um, see what your code's doing in production. Um, it uses um, Jetty, Logback, Log4j, Apache HTTP client, and you basically just configure your code to integrate it into there. For application architecture, um, while I recommend one page applications, um, it's not always true that pulling down JSON and processing it on the server side is a good idea. Um, the reason for that is because Twitter, Airbnb, and Charm have all switched from doing that to doing it the old-fashioned way where they're still using Ajax, but they're pulling HTML and not doing the processing on the client. The reason for that is, well, there's just not that many MacBook Pros out there with 16 gigs of RAM that can process the client as good as you might think. There's still IE7 users. There's still IE8 users, there's Windows XP, and there's just slow machines. So by sending down HTML, that might be a better application architecture. Um, a quote from Thomas Fuchs, the uh, creator of Scriptaculous, I've come to the realization that this much client-side processing and decoupling is detrimental to both the speed of development, the application performance, a ton of JavaScript has to be loaded and evaluated each time you fire up the app. It's better to let the server handle HTML rendering and minimize the use of JavaScript on the client. So, and I've seen this too, that if you have to support like IE7 and IE8, you might want to just do the traditional 
web app that doesn't use that much AJAX because people are used to clicking on something and having a page load. And a lot of times with the single page apps, I've even had instances where I had to add in the page loading indicators because people expected the page to go blank to let a new page load. So it can be tough to you know, handle people's expectations. Um, and then you can use the Ajaxified body with PJAX, which is a pretty nice pattern where you just you add classes to your, um, your links, essentially, and then you have uh, indicators that say, hey, when you click on this link, load it via Ajax, but load it into this part of the page. And so it's a nice little library for kind of getting that HTML bit without you know, doing the client-side processing. Um, if you're developing for mobile devices, I recommend using PhoneGap if you want to stick with HTML5. Um, chances are, if you want really good performance and you want it now, um, you might as well just write a native app. Um, I think there is a lot of validity in using HTML5 to develop apps on the phone, um, but I've seen a lot of people just do the native app. Um, right now, what we're trying at my client starts like next month, the project does, we're going to write an Angular app that actually sits on the desktop and gets packaged as a PhoneGap app. So if you watch my blog over the next couple of months, I'll tell you about that experience. Um, otherwise, you just add a viewport tag. I've done that for so many clients and, and done a lot of work to just make their website mobile optimized and, and not done you know, a full-on app. Um, you can do CSS3 media queries. Um, this is some script that you can hide the address bar. If your page is heavy, um, this doesn't always work. So the advantage of putting this into your page is that you know when the page loads, address bar disappears, there's a little more real estate on the web app uh, or on the UI. But I've also seen if, if the page takes a while to load, um, the person will try to click on something, and then you shift the page, and then you just basically F them. So try not to do that. We had to remove it after a while. Um, this is for disabling the focus. Um, when you click on a uh, form field, and you type in you know, your username or your password, a lot of times it'll zoom in, and it won't zoom back out. So this prevents it from zooming in. So a nice handy tip if you're doing a, a web app. Um, my mobile app experience is available on Parlays. Um, you can watch it from two years ago. I developed an iPhone app that basically tracked your fitness, and I tried to do it with HTML5 without actually using any native app. And what I found was I had to use PhoneGap because I wanted to do geo-tracking. And geo-tracking doesn't run in the foreground or in the background when you basically lock your phone. And so if you want to do anything that the phone has as far as a capability, you do need to probably hook into the native API and PhoneGap allows you to do that. You can see here that two things that I hooked into was the background modes, um, the app registers for location updates, and the app plays audio. So I wanted to listen to music while I was doing it. And I was able to get it to do both those, but only with PhoneGap. I couldn't do it as a web app. I couldn't do it any other way. So if you need to hook into the native capabilities, you have to use either a native app or PhoneGap to package your application. Lessons learned from that experience was uh, develop your mobile client first. Um, do it as a one-page app. Um, don't rely on the internet, which is tough. Um, but if you can you know, get your data initially without talking to the internet, it's great. Um, keep your static assets locally. Um, and this was because when I packaged my PhoneGap application, I actually still referred to like CSS and JavaScript on the server, and that, that didn't work very well at all. Um, and more than anything, I learned the bleeding edge can be painful. Um, only write it if you're getting funded for it. Um, and then with the cloud, I've used a fair amount of cloud servers. Uh, Heroku, I think, is great. You can deploy a web app um, written in Java to Heroku in about two minutes. Um, I deploy a lot of Grails and Play apps there. I think developers should use it for like their development sandbox because you can easily demo to other users in your company just by deploying to Heroku. If you have a database that's local and you can't put it outside your company, obviously that's a little tough. Um, but it does support Ruby, Node.js, Clojure, Java, Python, Scala. All those are supported. Um, Cloud Foundry is another good one for uh, Spring, Grail, Scala, Play, and Node. Um, and it's got all kinds of back-end databases that you can use. Um, the other one that I've tried and I really like is uh, Ravello. And they're kind of new in the space. They allow you to take existing VMs and upload them. And they also allow you to build them through a, a web UI to you know, add like Apache DS and a Apache server. And, and I've built an LDAP server in the cloud and used them because there was no other real cloud provider that I could use except for Amazon and doing it like command line version. 
Um, but they allowed you to do it all through UI and deploy it to not just Amazon, but other cloud providers too. And if you want to do it yourself, I'd take a look at Tommy. Um, I believe there's a couple sessions here on it. And uh, Tom EE is basically the web profile for Java EE. And uh, they strip out you know, anything that's unnecessary. And um, it starts even faster in Tomcat. So if you're already using Tomcat, you know, it might be worth a look. And I also recommend uh, Michael Zalewski's The Tangled Web. It's a great book that doesn't really talk about um, the back end and the authoring of web applications. It talks about all the things you can do to exploit a web application. And there's like 100 different things you can do just to a URL. And like mangling a URL, you can get into a web application. So it kind of opens your eyes to what your vulnerabilities might be. Um, beware of SQL and content ejection. Disable cross-site scripting. Um, and always use HTTPS if you can. And uh, the book helps you understand what browsers have to deal with. Obviously, there's OWASP, Open Web Application Security Project. It's kind of a messy website. It's tough to figure out what they really want you to do. Um, but they do have some tools you can use, and they do have some pretty good research. Um, the seven misconfigurations in your web XML might help. Um, error pages, if they're not configured. Um, people can see stack traces and things like that right from Tomcat. Um, if you don't have your authorization configured right, your SSL isn't configured right, you're not using the secure flag on your SSL, um, all those can be issues. Um, with cookies, there's an HTTP only flag you can use where JavaScript is not able to access cookies, which can be good for you know, people trying to do some content injection. Um, if you're using J session ID, try to turn that off um, to track your URLs. Or not setting a session timeout can be dangerous as well. And here's a, a URL to read more about that. There's also a great new thing called the content security policy. Here's what it looks like. It's a header that describes what can access what on your site. And so it's a, basically an HTTP header with a white list of trusted content, um, bans inline scripts, inline event handlers, and JavaScript URLs. So this is especially important if you're dealing with user content and not just content that you create. Um, doesn't allow eval function or set timeout or set interval, which are considered dangerous from JavaScript. Supported in Chrome 16, Safari 6, Firefox 4. Um, very limited in IE10, but it'll get better, so be aware of it. And here's a great um, introduction to it on HTML5 rocks. And Z attack proxy is actually a tool that I use. Um, there's a URL to download it that's able to actually um, go ahead and scan your project and um, see your vulnerabilities. And that's how to fix them. So get some fast hardware, use IntelliJ, leverage HTML5, create some high performance website in the cloud and um, care about security. And how do you stay modern? You come to conferences like this, you uh, submit a talk if you want to put yourself on the spot, you write, you do, and you get paid for it. And uh, remember, technology doesn't create success, people do. That's it.